you know, life aboard the Iowa was, um, I won't say it was easy, and I won't say it was particularly challenging. It was hard work. We worked really hard on here. We considered ourselves to be really a cut above everybody else. When I arrived on board, we got handed a book that said Battleship Standards. And uh, we used to have a phrase around here. So when you go and get stuff, that's just where we start as battleship sailors. And it was it was busy. It was fun. We worked really hard. I think we played really hard. Uh, as a 17-year-old kid, um, it was uh, it was a really eye-opening experience. And I was always amazed as to how a bunch of 19-year-old kids could run a ship like this. Of course, we had super, we had veterans or people ex of experience, and I think the biggest thing you learn, and I did, it was to get along with people. We had to get along. We was, I'm sure there's a few scuffles somewhere along the line, but everybody, you respected everyone because they was doing what you were supposed to be doing. In Korea, we saw combat, and uh, uh, it was, uh, Kind of hard to explain about combat. This ship went in, they fired at us, we took off, we got it out of their range, we sent our shells in, helicopter said knocked out the guns. Anybody that shot at us didn't know what they were doing. So we took care of the guns that shot at us. I believe we, were, we got two combat stars and uh, we, they were fired at us a number of times. Nothing ever hit us. We walk in through here. Now every morning, We'd, uh, we'd have quarters for muster, instruction, and inspection, right? So every morning, underway or at sea, we come in and every, make sure everybody's there, right? So we come walking in here into the machine shop. This is on the main deck. I oh, know the second deck down. And if whoever got here first got to have a seat up on these benches, which are kind of full now because we got a machinist that actually works here now as a volunteer. His name is Bill Maggio, and he runs our uh, machinery, our, uh, our lathes and stuff. But this would be full of machinery repairmen. So we crowd 60 guys in here and one guy would take muster. And if there was anything to say to the, to the division at the time, that would be called out in, uh, in quarters. So every morning at quarters, I think it was seven or 7.15 a.m., we'd, we'd all be at, hanging out in here. And uh, there was always these sh shavings were everywhere. These shavings were everywhere. And one time, the captain came down here and there was no shavings, right? Because he didn't think people were working, right? So he would uh, be, and they were like, well, no, we clean up our shop. So they'd save the shavings, right? Had bags of it. So whenever they knew that the captain was coming in, they'd throw it all over the floor. Look how busy we are, you know, just to say, and he wouldn't mind, you know, or he wouldn't say anything, you know, but if it was clean, he didn't think anybody was working. Now in here, is where they kept the logs and stuff like that for the MRs and a lot of the stuff that we had in A-Gang. There was an old TV up here. So this was like the break room. They had an old TV up here. A lot of the TVs are gone today. If we could find old 80s TVs, we, we, we definitely install them. Would we get them working again? We might, because we got a great IT guy named David Canfield. So he could probably get them going again. I know we're gonna try to get the telephones going again, the old pay phones, and even the ship service phones. We're gonna try to get them going again. It's gonna take a lot of time. But this is, there used to be a table here, and uh, the desk is still there, and this is where they would take breaks. They'd eat chow down here sometimes too. And after uh, cruises, when we came off of some six month cruises, the guy's name was Dominic Pellicciotti. He was from Pennsylvania, and his parents would actually show up, and they would bring a lot of sp big spaghettis, and they would feed the whole division. Yeah, great guy. I haven't seen him in 30 years. Well, yeah, this is, so this was the machine shop. I wish they could bring you more places like down to engineering and stuff like that, but a lot of it's is secured for uh, for like uh, safety reasons and things like that. So slowly but surely, we're going to open up the whole ship, you know, and that, that's going to be that's going to be a good day. But we're real happy to have her here now in uh, Los Angeles, California. She's open to the public. It takes a good hour, hour and a half to go through the ship. There's plenty to see. I haven't heard any negative feedback. We have a great crew. Our volunteers are the heart of the crew. And uh, yeah, it's pretty good. Slowly but surely, we'll be opening more and more spaces for the public to enjoy. I'm in the Veterans Association, and uh, some of my closest friends in the association were people who met, whom I met through the Veterans Association 
These guys were working on the ship before I was born, uh, but they were working in the same space, doing the same job that I did when I was on board. This is inside of Mount 54 of the five inch gun turrets. Uh, I wish you could see better inside there. My GQ station was actually in between the two barrels, a little more up forward. And honestly, it was like a little, real tight squeeze to get in there because there was just equipment all over the place. It was very tight fitting. And uh, when the hatches here closed, uh, it got very warm uh, during it. Cause oh, you know, you're down in the Caribbean doing these gunfire exercises and everything. Uh, so yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty tough. We did have, we were lucky, we had the earplugs to wear, but our fellow shipmates from World War II and the Korean War, they, I don't believe they had the earplugs. I was, I was walking in a mid pace. You never help, never fasten your helmets if you're on top side. And I stepped through midship one time, just as one went off and it whipped me around pretty good. In the, in, but I didn't mind the 16 inch as bad as the five inch because at the time I first came aboard, I was a gun director of a 40 millimeter and right above a five inch mount on the port side, just five inch shot right up over us. And that would really definitely, it just hurt when they went off. Concussion from the 16 would hurt in your chest, you know, but if you step top side or on the deck, it hurt. Going to Japan aboard the ship, we hit, uh, a high, a very bad storm. Solid waves were coming over the bow, over number one and number two turrets and hitting the navigation bridge. And when the bow would go under, it would look like we were a submarine almost, you know. There were two 20 millimeter guns mounted right on the point of the bow and it, they had shields on them, about three quarter inch steel. And it either folded those shields back together or it tore them off completely. And there were two round tubs with 40 millimeters in them on the port and starboard side forward of number one turret. And the one on the starboard side looked like it had a bomb had hit it. A 40 millimeter gun was all twisted and bang. We had two motor whale boats on davits, port and starboard. And they, the bow and the stern were out of both of them where the waves had hit them. And we lost three airplanes overboard. We lost two 40-foot Liberty launches, the captain's gig, and the sundry other, anything that was on the weather decks was gone. It just, and no personnel were allowed on the weather decks at all. It was a pretty violent storm. One up off the beach in uh, North Korea, uh, Wonsan, Hungnam, Songjin, Kojo, many of the harbors we go into. And for instance, every day there'd be a major battleship or a heavy cruiser in Wonsan Harbor shooting the place up. And uh, we spent many, many days in Wonsan Harbor and are taking our turn. Um, the most uh, two things that were highlights of the battle engagement experience that I was involved with was one was when we were shooting at a beach. We got a call at two in the afternoon to cease fire and because the DMS Thompson had been hit, she was about um, an hour and a half or so away from us. And so they told everybody to stay at your station. They swung the ship around. We went flying speed, 33 knots, everything out to race to the ship. The, it was a big rooster tail of water coming out of the fan tail. And it was the fastest that ship had ever, had ever moved. And there I, I picked up my binoculars and I saw the Thompson coming into view off the beach. Uh, I saw blood red coming down out of the scuppers and she'd taken a hit on the flying bridge. I believe it killed about uh, five people. And uh, as, as I told you earlier, these movies are available. What, what happened at that time, we took off the bodies and the wounded and then the Thompson limped back to, to Japan. We moved in offshore where she'd been hit and commenced firing, the 16s, and we fired until two o'clock in the morning. We were mad and they knew we were mad and they paid a price for it. For me personally, it's a very difficult uh, 
feeling to be back aboard the Iowa. The first year of the Iowa was one of the best of my life. It, it was fantastic. That was the year, as I related, we carried out convoy escort operations. But the second year, particularly the time I left the Iowa after the April 19th, uh, 1989 explosion was a very difficult time. I'll just leave it at that. I, I just, I have a hard time today uh, still dealing with a lot of that. It was a beautiful day. We were down south in uh, Puerto Rico and uh, it was one of blue sky days and it was an average day underway. It was routine. And I was down in forward auxiliary machinery room where, where, where I was a top watch. So I was in charge of the space and the training and the plant because it was a water plant. So we made water for the ship, fresh water and uh, water for feed water for the boilers. And uh, a routine gun shoot and we had an admiral on board, so we were going to shoot the guns for the admiral, and uh, and something went wrong. And uh, my sp it, it was it, the sound was different in my space because if you look at this ship, turret two is directly in front of forward AMR, right? So turret two is it, I mean, so we were the next space over from forward AMR is turret two. So when it, the explosion occurred, my space filled up with smoke immediately. So I evacuated everybody. Some guys just stood there. His name was Dennis Archibald from Chicago. He stood there. Myself and Petty Officer Foster grabbed him and threw him out. I shut off the uh, supply uh, vent and kept the exhaust going. I ran down and hit the main drain pump and the emergency diesel generator did not start automatically, which it should, but she was such an old ship. A lot of things we did, uh, a lot of things didn't work the way they should. She was just such an old battleship. But we knew because we were training all the time, we lived there and we really knew our jobs, even as such young kids. I was 23 years old at the time. So uh, yeah, and uh, so I started the generator and, and uh, number three main drain pump, was, which was a fire main pump. And we ran out of the space. I suited up and uh, went into the turret. And that was the second wave or maybe even the third wave of firefighters that had gone in there. Yeah, the other two were, uh, that went in there were in my division. Uh, Petty Officer Sh Robert Shepard and Petty Officer Troy Johnson, Petty Officer Thad Harms, they were first in and they, and Shepard put the fire out, you know, and uh, when I, by the time I got in there, I was cooling down a gun, uh, number three gun, because HT1 Smith from our division was the on-scene leader. So he was in charge of the whole thing. Mind you, we never had any turret fire training, ever. We did main space fire training, which was your fire rooms and your engine rooms. We never had turret training ever. Why would we? We never expected anything like that to happen. And through the years since I've been back now as a volunteer, it's an, it was an accident. It was an accident. I talked to a lot of guys that were there. We're all older now in our late 40s or 50s. And I'm 50 years old. And uh, they all agree. And because and, I'd ask them individually, you know, what? It, it was an over ram. Uh, it was over rammed. It was the perfect storm. The uh, powder was old. It was sat in uh, no, uh, Yorktown in, uh, when we were in the yard. So we offloaded everything to get into the yards. And uh, when we came out of the yards, we unloaded everything. We went out to sea and we just picked up where we left off. And it was an accident. She got over rammed, old powder and yes, sir. The story of the Iowa is not the story of April 19th. The story of the Iowa is every day that was not April 19th. It includes April 19th. It includes the incident, but that is not the story of Iowa. One of the, the big healing moments occurs. It occurred for me and it occurred for other people that I know when you realize April 19th is not the story of Iowa. It's one day in her life. And it's not my story either. It's one day in my life. The story of this ship is about everybody that served on board, the World War II crew, the Korea crew, the 80s crew. And it's about what we all went through, wearing the cloth of our country. And if I could pass one thing on, my hope for being involved here, is that the next generation will understand that there are men who put, or I'm sorry, there are people who put their lives in harm's way so that they can enjoy the, type, the style of life that they have. I uh, was class A radar school. We could get off the base every night, but we didn't have the money to get off the base and get haircuts too. So 
the Marines wouldn't let us off unless we really trimmed sharp around the ears and I'd got a pair of scissors to start trimming hair. And when I went home, I bought a pair of clippers and I would uh, charge 50 cents illegally. <laughs> Wasn't supposed to charge anyone, but some would pay me. I say you pay day, but they buy four cartons of cigarettes for 10 cents a pack and wouldn't pay me for my haircut, 50 cents. But I kept a record, and coming back from a, a cruise one time, we had an inspection. Captain Smithberg, our captain, was inspecting our group and said, Mr. Bunker, your crew looks pretty sharp, but they all need haircuts. He said, but Captain, you know that the time we spent playing these war games and practicing and being on the bridge, you observed my men, I'm sure. And they do need haircuts, but we don't have time to get to the barber shop question was asked, does anyone know how to cut hair in your division? And I didn't volunteer at that time. <laughs> so so uh, my buddy in the back said, Partridge can. Captain asked for Partridge to step forward and I responded that I could. And he said his duties each Friday, and we didn't have a barber chair, we also had that well-known can we sat on, <laughs> and uh, I'd give the guys haircuts. We had a six chair shop, we just couldn't get there. And one time on a cruise to England, I had a, uh, we had pneumatic tubes all over the ship and I had a message come to CIC for me to report to stateroom so-and-so at a given time, which I did. And I thought that was the communication officer. And I was afraid at the time that something terrible had happened at home. And I knocked on his door, he asked me and he said, could you cut my hair? I said, yes, sir. So I went, and the officers had their own barber, but I went and got my equipment and gave him a haircut, and lo and behold, he presented me with a dollar. I thought he was setting me up, you know. I said, sir, I'm not allowed to take that. He said, I know that, but we're getting ready to go to Portsmouth, England, and you might want a beer. So I took the dollar. I think it was March the 1st or March the 2nd of 52. We had just left Yokosuka, and we knew then we were heading, heading right into the Korean War. And I got the morning watch on the Iowa. And uh, that morning I had to sit up on the uh, crow's nest, the O11 deck, you know, and report into the bridge. And it was pitch dark, you know, and some way or another, uh, and you can say it to everyone, we didn't think about climbing the ladders and stuff to get up on the O11. I don't remember a thing about getting up there that morning, but I do remember it was pitch black. We got up there, and as the morning pressed on, it got lighter and lighter. And I looked out in the northwest, and I think I saw something. I kept watching. Well, it was a, it was the superstructure of the big cruisers and carriers out there, and I could see them. So I reported to the bridge. I found them. Here's Task Force 77. Of course, they've been watching it on radar, but I always think I was the first one on the ship to see Task Force 77. <laughs> I'm proud to be a third generation. Iowa crew member. Remember the uh, USS Iowa's uh, crew. My grandfather served uh, during the Korean War as did my father Jack C. Bolander was a gunnery officer. My grandfather Wayne R. Loud commanded the Iowa in the mid-50s uh, and I found out recently that my great-grandfather served on a battleship. It wasn't the Iowa but it was the USS Illinois in 1907. He enlisted uh, in the U.S. Navy and served aboard. So I'm proud to be a fourth generation battleship, uh, in this case battleship marine, but a family that served on battleships. We have some fun going ashore on the beach. I, I do remember, yeah, going to, we were in Nagoya, nine and a half miles out. And so in the afternoon, a bunch of us took the boat ashore. It took an hour, a good hour to get in and got some type of transportation to downtown Nagoya, which had a very big, wide, uh, dirt street, main street, and during World War II, the Japanese used this for their, take their Zeros and their Mitsubishis or fly off of it. But we went into, uh, we were all dressed in our nice officer's uniform, the shoulder board, and we went into a department store that for some reason had an escalator in it, so we rode the escalator up to the second floor, and it was a toy department. So we walked over there, and uh, we started playing with the toys they had. There were wooden handmade toys. One of them was a little thing you could push across, uh, uh, the floor and they had a bunch of uh, little uh, ponies and things, animals that would pop up and down. And uh, Ensign Bolander, one of us, he, he bought the thing. We went down the block and crossed the street, the hotel, which was the officer's club, 
And Jack was pushing that thing back and forth on top of the uh, uh, bar. And we were feeling no pain and so on. Uh, a little while later, I decided I was going back to ship. So I went down the corner, was ready to take a step off the curb. And I stopped because the light hadn't changed. But some Japanese stepped off the curb and got out in the traffic. And bang, he got hit by a, a, a taxi cab. He tumbled like that. The guy in the cab gets out, picks him up, puts him in the back of the cab, and they drove off. Uh, I went back to the bar. And later on, I'm told that Jack came back to the ship with that thing and um, started pushing it across the quarter deck, maybe 11 or 12 o'clock at night. The officer deck didn't like it, and so he, he got himself in some trouble. Uh, and in recent years, a few years back, I did talk to Jack on the telephone. He said he still had the thing. You see behind us are the actual armored box launchers in which the Tomahawk cruise missiles were stored. And the Marines were working very closely with the missiles uh, personnel. Anytime they had to do maintenance on these, the Marines would set up an exclusion area to help protect that area. Mount 55 is a starboard side aft behind me uh, to, to my right, two five inch guns that the Marines manned from the gun room all the way down to the uh, powder magazine. And they provided personnel and manning and they trained for that mission of providing fire support with two five inch guns. In addition to that, the executive officer of the Marine Detachment would be sitting in, in uh, the mount right behind you is a uh, spotter's position to help spot the, and adjust the rounds. Uh, in addition to that, several of our Marines, particularly those who had the artillery MOS, Military Occupational Specialty, we would train to call and adjust fire support missions. And very frequently when the ship needed to do a gunnery exercise, they would call upon these Marines to give the same call for fire, the same types of commands that would be given from a shore fire control party on the beach. Our Marines would do that same mission. I can relate. One of my favorite stories is the story of the Iowa during its uh, convoy escort operations in the Persian Gulf in 1988. Surely 1988. The Iowa was sent initially to the Mediterranean and subsequently to the Persian Gulf to participate in operations Earnest Will in which they rounded up convoys during the Iran-Iraq war. This is the war in which the USS Stark had been hit by a missile, and the Stark had been part of these convoy escort operations itself. But the Iowa was called upon to do so and would link up in the vicinity of Masir Island off of Oman. And there would link up with convoys, mostly tankers, that would be going back into the Gulf. One time, uh, on one occasion, just before dusk, out of nowhere, a Soviet helicopter came right upon the Iowa. And this time, the uh, Iowa's Marines, as I mentioned, uh, provided gun crews, but they manned 50 caliber machine guns throughout the main deck of the Iowa. And they manned Mark 19 automatic grenade launchers. And they manned other small arms to respond to small boat threats to the arm to the Iowa, potentially the Iranian Boghom or speedboats, but any kind of small boat that would have threatened the Iowa during the convoy escort uh, operations. Well, out of nowhere, the Soviet helicopter pulled up, and of course, the Marines do what Marines do instinctively. They turned and they pointed their guns at the Soviet helicopter, and the, it was a helix helicopter with a counter-rotating uh, rotors, which is a very peculiar helicopter if you've ever seen one. Uh, but it surprised us. We weren't expecting it. The Marines uh, had not been briefed that that was a likely uh, scenario. But I can still remember an individual on the uh, 08 level yelling down and telling our Marines to stand down, to not point the guns at the Soviet helicopter, that they were not to uh, threaten in any way this, this uh, helicopter. But I'm still proud to this day that the Marines did instinctively what a Marine is trained to do, and that was to be able to uh, respond uh, as quickly as possible to a threat. There was a NATO ship that we passed in the Caribbean one bright sunny day. But one of the ship's crew members happened to move from the main deck up towards the, the 04 level bridge where the ship is commanded by the officer of the deck. And this individual was dressed as Santa Claus. And the Marine wasn't ready for Santa Claus to come up to the officer of the deck because the Santa Claus in this case also had a naval sword with him, which is, as we all know, is a weapon, not necessarily a, a automatic weapon, but nonetheless, he was not 
expecting this individual dressed as Santa Claus otherwise, so he told the individual, halt, who goes there? And the individual responded, it's Santa Claus, who do you think I am? He said, well, show me your ID card, Santa Claus. And Santa Claus did not have an ID card, so the Marine proceeded to call a security alert. And Santa Claus went down, this is the non-skid on the deck, Santa Claus ate a little non-skid, the Marine did, reaction force uh, responded, and uh, we were criticized because the entire operation, the ship didn't come to us, the ship continued to move, but as we're passing this NATO ship, uh, we had to go to a security alert because this individual was a potential threat. But there are a number of jokes that were made afterwards that the Marines were not gonna get anything for Christmas that year for having threatened Santa Claus. I was a bit naive, I'll admit, and uh, if anybody put, got pranked, it was probably me, but I don't, I don't uh, other than typical things like, you know, somebody said, go watch, go for the mail buoy watch, and I almost fell for it. Um, and I, I remembered somebody say they needed 100 yards of gig line, which uh, for you civilians, that's the line in your shirt going down to your belt buckle and your zipper. And uh, had I not remembered that from boot camp, I probably would have fallen for that too. Uh, Navy, I grew up a lot in the Navy. Then we turned around and went through the Straits of Peralter all the way up to Norway, to the Arctic Circle, where we did the uh, famous, it's called a blue nose ceremony, where we ran around the decks semi-clothed. I think we had some clothing on, but in sub-freezing temperatures. And just as we came back in the ship, we got a bucket of ice water poured on us, and we were then dubbed blue noses. Uh, but as I mentioned, when we went to Diego Garcia, we crossed the line, the equator, and we endured a uh, initiation ceremony that would not be tolerated in today's Navy called a polywog ceremony. And we uh, became uh, orders, the Royal Order of Neptune, I think is the name for uh, crossing the line. Then we did two major deployments when I was on board in 1987 and 1989. Those cruises were six months apiece, uh, and we would go through the Atlantic. We got our shell back, which was an initiation where we went through the Suez Canal and, and down into the Indian Ocean. And then we went up into the Persian Gulf, past the Gulf of Oman. There was silkworm missiles there. The Iran-Iraq war was going on. We spent over 90 days just traveling. The, it was like glass, the, silk, the Persian Gulf. And then we'd go up to the, north, the northern part. We'd hit Germany and uh, England. And there was a few other countries too, Spain, France, and the Med. And then we went as high as uh, Norway. And then we went even further up into uh, the North Atlantic and got our blue nose initiation, which was a lot of fun. What they do there is they actually paint your nose blue, right? And then you go out, have to go up to the main deck, right? And you have to run around the main deck while getting buckets of water splashed on you and a fire hose. And I'll never forget this, because we, I, after you do it once, then uh, we did it twice, right? So we did it once in 87, we did it again in 89. And I had my guys, I already went through it, right, in 89. So I'm like, come here, give me your nose, right? And I'm just painting their nose. And they're putting their jackets on, right? And they're getting ready to go up. I'm like, no, 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 you got to take your jacket off. As a matter of fact, you take your shirt off. Leave your skivvies on and your boondockers and get up on the main deck. And they're like, nah, right? So they did. It was a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun. Different initiations like that. Yeah, it was pretty cool. I met my wife Colleen when the USS Iowa visited New York City after our uh, deployment to the Middle East, the Gulf uh, convoy operations. Uh, the ship was invited up by Mayor Koch to participate in the Navy's Fleet Week. I needed a date and I wasn't quite sure where to turn. I called a friend of mine whose sister-in-law lived in New York City and he informed me that his sister-in-law was engaged, so that didn't work. Uh, but his wife had another friend that perhaps uh, would be suitable. I called her up and she agreed to meet me only if I could find dates for two other and two of her friends, her roommate and someone else she worked with because she didn't want to take the train in from New Jersey by herself, which I can understand. So at that time, my best friend on the ship was the Catholic priest, the ship's chaplain. And I asked her if her friends would mind going out with a Catholic priest. She said they weren't picky. So uh, it turned out to be a wonderful evening. Uh, we met up, we went to a Yankees game, uh, went to a Broadway show later, and uh, let's see, a couple discos, it was just a, a wonderful time. And that's probably one of the greatest ways uh, being on board the Iowa changed my life or, or impacted me from having been introduced to my wife.